It is great to see so many of you here. Yeah. yeah. And for those of you that are joining us uh, live through our video on YouTube or through our website, great to, to be seen. We wish we could see you. There we go. There's some audio. Maybe we can get the house lights up too for folks. That'd be great. Well, today I want to start off with, a, I think, a question that maybe crosses your mind every once in a while. And that question is, are you going to heaven? If you are like most Americans, 75% of you think, yes, I'm going to heaven. You believe that whatever it is that you've done or not done or whatever, you just think, yes, I'm going to heaven. And I, th I find that number remarkably high. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And I want to really discuss kind of this modern view, I think, that exists in the world today of salvation and heaven and, and how we get there, what that's all wrap, wrapped up in. And, and I think the dominant thought or the dominant theme of our culture regarding the afterlife is that the results of our actions in this life determine where I go in the next life. Don't you find that to be the case for most people out in our culture, in our society? They tend to believe what I do here and now, how I live, if I'm good or bad, determines whether or not I get the present, right, of heaven in the next life. Haven't you heard people talk like this? I've got a couple kind of quotes here for you to maybe kind of reinforce that idea. The famous philosopher Tupac Shakur, he says, quote, I believe that everything that you do, bad, comes back to you. So everything that I do that's bad, I'm going to suffer from it. But in my mind, I believe that what I'm doing is right. So I feel like I'm going to heaven. That's Tupac. Uh, here's a, another writer. She's kind of a, a philosopher and writer, thinker. And she says this. Her name is Susie Cassim. She says, your aim is to make sure that the right book on your shoulder weighs more than the bad book on your left shoulder. How's that? Thank you. All right, I'll start again. Susie Cassim. Your aim is to make sure that the book on your right shoulder, the good book, weighs more than the bad book on your left shoulder. The scales are real regardless of your chosen faith. There's a measurement system to be found in all the world's religions. After all, does it make sense for all souls, good or bad, to end up in the same place? Of course not. To really secure the very best setting in the afterlife, the vibrations of your good deeds must surpass your death. Pretty interesting. Another writer, Frank Sonnenberg, says this, be a good person, everything else is secondary. So, is this view of entering heaven correct? Is this what the Bible teaches? To have more good than bad? And when you encounter this perspective out in the world, because you will encounter it, how are you going to address those kinds of questions or statements that people come up? They talk about karma. Oh, I did this good thing, now this good thing's happening to me. It must be karma. Today I want to really see how our cultural view of salvation is broken and how salvation actually works. That's what we're going to look at today. So if you want, you can turn with me to Matthew 19. We're going to read verses 16 through 30 kind of answer that big question. How is our cultural view of salvation broken and how does salvation really work? So that's Matthew 19, verses 16 through 30. You can go ahead and turn there. Matthew's the first book in the New Testament. If you're not familiar with your Bible, just go ahead and look in the, the table of contents up in the front. You can find Matthew. And chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. I'll give you a second to go ahead and turn there. We're going to see here that Jesus encounters a young man who comes up to him and says, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And Jesus is going to have a conversation with him, and the man's going to leave very sad because of what Jesus said, and then he's going to have some dialogue with his disciples about how you get into heaven. So this is verse 16. Behold, a man came up to him, that's coming up to Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, 
why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, well, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go. Sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished, saying, well, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And Peter in reply said, well, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is God's word. Why don't we pray real quick, and then we'll dive right in here. Father, we ask this morning for the pouring out of your Spirit on us to make our hearts receptive to your word, to guide us into truth that can only come because you've sent your Son first, and he conquered Satan's sin and death. And so I pray that we would be ushered into truth through the power of your spirit, and that it would transform us from the inside out. Give us fresh eyes today to see what you want us to say, and I pray that you would speak through me in a powerful way. In your name we pray, amen. So I think we need to ask ourselves, how is our cultural view of salvation broken? I think we really get a great view of that here in this passage. And And the way that this cultural view of life is broken, I think, is the same way it was broken in the culture of this young man. I think we're both broken in the same exact way. And even though this is 2,100 years ago or 2,000 years ago, whatever, some things never change. And our view of heaven and how it works is broken in the same exact way that it was back then. And here's what I mean. I think that we believe eternal life is a mathematical problem to be solved. We think it's a math equation. How many of you loved math? One, two, three. Wow, yes. But see, all of you are mathematicians, right? Every person in our culture is a mathematician because we think salvation, eternal life is a math problem to be solved. And and here's what I mean. First of all, notice that the young man asks Jesus, what good deed did he need to do to be sure of eternal life? Right? He says, what do I need to do? What good thing do I have to do to make sure that I get it in heaven? And this is a mathematical problem of addition. People think, I can keep living the same exact way I've always been living, and all I need to do is add something to my life. Add this goodness. Add this good deed. You know what? If I start going to the rescue mission once a month, if I just add that to my life, well, then I'm doing some good deeds I just add that and I get heaven, right? We think it's an addition problem. Or we think if it's just giving away money, right? Now, what's the opposite of addition? Subtraction. So it's the same kind of, you know, level of operation. We also tend to think if I just take something out of my life, stop doing this. If I stop drinking so much alcohol, then I'll go to heaven. If I stop being angry, if I stop being greedy, if I stop looking at pornography. So we kind of tend to think that salvation 
is a mathematical equation. I need to add something to my life or I need to take away something from my life. And if I do that, I get heaven. That's how the culture thinks. That's what Tupac means by there's good and there's bad deeds. And if I just do enough good and not enough bad, then I'm guaranteed of something. I just add it on. I just tack it on. Like the young man, we think that this is just addition and subtraction, and it's not. Salvation is not additive. You can't just slap on some good deeds to who you are and think that that changes you. I also want you to see that like the young man, we tend to think that Christianity is something that I do. So he says, what good deeds, addition, do I need to do? Christianity, people, is not something you do. I don't know how else to say that. A lot of times I like to say things in different words or phrases. I don't know how else to say it. It's not something you do. There are Christian behaviors that we do in following Jesus, but Christianity itself is not something you do, and most of the world thinks it is. Every other religion in the world is about what you do, and Christianity is never about what you do. You do, and so we make that mistake as well. This is the farthest thing from the truth, and and here's the thing we need to understand. Doing does not result in transformation. Transformation results in doing. This is a key, key truth, right? Doing does not result in transformation. Transformation results in doing. And by the way, this is only the case in terms of salvation. I'm not talking about every other aspect of life. I'm talking specifically about salvation because every other aspect of life, we know that doing actually does result in transformation. Okay, If you decide that you want to lose weight, how do you lose weight? Do you just sit on your couch with your hand buried in a bag of lays, watching TV, thinking, I'm transforming my mind into losing weight? you got to get up off the couch, go walk a few miles. you got to avoid eating the chips, right? you got to do things to get transformed, right? We know that in other areas. They talk about if you want to change your mindset, you have to just go and do the thing first, and then your mindset changes. But that's not the case with salvation, and that's because salvation is a spiritual thing. It happens at the spiritual level, not the physical level. So in the physical level, your actions change your mindset. This has been proven, but this is not the case for salvation. And our mistake is that we apply physical world rules to a spiritual level problem. And we think, I just need to do something. No. First, you must be transformed. This young man thinks, I just need to do something, and he's totally mistaken, and we're totally mistaken when we think this way. So see, even if you already know Jesus, right, you know where I'm going with this message, and you already know Jesus, this problem runs so deep that we still think, I need to do things to make God happy with me, to not feel guilty, right, to overcome maybe some hurdles that maybe might just kind of have some bad marks on me or whatever. This, this is deeply embedded in us. I almost would call this the default nature of the human soul, is to kind of think that I just need to do a little bit. And I want you to know right now, there is nothing you have to do to make Jesus love you more than he already does. Right? Transformation leads to doing, not the other way around. I mean, can you rest in that, really? Can you be satisfied deep in your soul saying, if I'm just transformed, there's not a thing I have to do to make God happier with me, to make him love me more? I mean, you got to meditate on that. That's a crazy thought because it's so contra to what the world says because everything in the world says you get what you deserve. It's absolutely countercultural. So, to the extent that you realize this is the extent to which you will be free to follow Jesus and to release everything else in this physical world. Pretty crazy. Like the young man also, we have a sense of right and wrong. Did you see that he has a sense of right and wrong? Did you notice that he has this sense of good and evil, of right and wrong? He, He tells Jesus, what good thing do I need to do? So, he knows there are good things, there's bad things, 
Where does that sense of goodness come from? Have you ever thought about this? We all have this. Our problem is thinking, like the young man, that we will know good and evil when we see it. But will you? The problem with that is that you are becoming the judge of good and evil, of right and wrong. And are you really sure that you can perceive that? See, God alone is the judge, the standard bearer of goodness. And that's why Jesus, you know, responds the way he does. Because God alone is the standard of goodness. Now, let's kind of be real with one another for a second. If God is the standard for goodness, can any of us be as good as God? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. (laughs) No, right? Our mistake is thinking, I'm better than Hitler, right? And we always go to Hitler, don't we? We always pick the worst possible example of humanity and go, oh, I'm better than that. Well, bravo, right? Very good. You didn't kill 20 million people, right? You, Hitler and Stalin, you're ahead of them. Way to go, right? That is not the standard. The standard is God himself and our mistake as a culture, is thinking that we can be arbiters of good and evil. And the the other problem is that that we really don't understand good and evil, right? When I tell people, oh, you know what, we're born in sin, we're born evil, people just react violently to that because they're thinking, I mean like demon spawn evil. And I don't mean that. What I mean is self-centered, want my own way, put myself in front of others, think I'm better than others. That's what I mean by evil, right? Because that's inside all of us. I'm putting myself in front of God, ultimately. That's what evil actually is. Telling God, no God, you're not the standard. I get to be up there. And we all live that way to a certain extent or another. And so we're extremely likely to believe as people, because we kind of bear our own standard, that we're actually better than we are. And this has been psychologically studied and proven, and it's called illusory superiority. Every single one of us, I got a newsflash for you, thinks that we're better than we actually are. Some of you are laughing. In a survey of faculty at the University of Nebraska, 68% of the faculty rated themselves in the top 25% of all teachers. I love that stat. 94% of that same faculty rated themselves as above average. Okay, think about that. Almost every single person thinks they're above average. There really can only be half. In a similar study, because this illusory superiority is everywhere, 87% of MBA students at Stanford rated their performance as above average. This has explained the phenomenon such as large amounts of stock trading where every trader thinks they are the best and most likely to succeed or the number of lawsuits that go to trial because every lawyer is convinced they're a better trial attorney than their opponent. We see this in cognitive tasks like in doing kind of rational tasks where you're given some kind of problem to solve. People always think they're better than they are. We see this in driving ability. 93% of U.S. drivers put themselves in the top 50% of safety. How good of a driver are you? Are you better than average? I'll bet you think you are. (laughs) We think that we are healthier than we are. We think that we're not immune to bias. We think that our IQ is higher than average or that I have a better memory. I mean, I could go on and on and on about all the categories in which we think we're better. We think that we're more popular than other people. We think that we have better relational happiness than other people. We think that we have better sexual lives than other people. On and on and on, we rank ourselves as superior. If this is the default of our mind, how we think all the time, is it any wonder that we think, I'm pretty good, I just need to do a few more good deeds and I'm going to heaven? This is our heart, right? It's so twisted, we can't see ourselves clearly. But we are amazing at seeing other people clearly, aren't we? We're completely blind to ourselves, but everybody else, we go, he's a terrible driver, right? I want to ride in three cars behind when he's driving, right? 
Because I don't know what's going to happen. He's terrible. Like the young man, when we're honest with ourselves, though, you have a moment of honesty. There's a part of you that wonders, have I been good enough? You see that question he asked Jesus, right? He says, what good deed do I need to do to be sure of going into heaven? And then he kind of says, well, what do I still lack? This is verse 20. The young man says to him, all of these laws that, that I've kept, so what do I still lack? That's an amazing question because Jesus just got done listing all the laws. And by the way, when Jesus does that, he doesn't mean to the young man, these are the only laws you have to keep. When Jesus lists those laws, that's from the Ten Commandments, the suggestion by Jesus is you've got to keep the whole law. These are just examples. So then the young man says, well, I've kept everything. Oh, is that illusory superiority? Right? I've kept all the laws. That's an amazing statement. And he says, so what am I still missing? Okay, wow. Guy is, clearly can't see himself. But nonetheless, there's a part of him that is deeply troubled, huh? There's a part of him that says, I am still missing something. There's something that's not right. There's something that's unsettled in my heart. There's a problem What else do I still lack, Jesus? And he had this deep sense there was brokenness in his spirit, and he's absolutely right. And I think that we as people have the same sense. We know that there's brokenness going on, and we need help. We're just not sure how to to solve it. So Jesus starts to answer him and kind of gives him some directions. And I think this really shows us how does eternal life actually work. Okay, and the requirements for heaven according to Jesus, occur through replacement, not through addition or subtraction. That's what I want us to see here. So Jesus tells this guy that he has to sell all of his possessions, give it to the poor, and then come and follow Jesus. And does the guy just go, yes, thank you, that is exactly what I wanted to know. I'll see you in a week. He's absolutely crushed by Jesus' response. And Jesus I love what Jesus does here, right? The young man kind of wants to keep things at a very cerebral level. He wants to keep it intellectual. He wants salvation to be a problem that he can solve. And Jesus says, you know, I'm going to go right for the heart. The real problem here, young man, is your heart. By the way, the law that I didn't mention, love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus calls that out here, right? And he says, okay, go sell everything you own and give it to the poor. And the guy leaves away sad because he has great possessions. Is is he just sad because he had many possessions? It's not that he had a lot of possessions that he's sad. He's sad because he loved his possessions. His wealth was his source of identity. And Jesus goes right for that and says, you know what? You've got to give that up. Jesus sees the man's problems are related to idolatry, putting something in your heart that you love, that you want, that you desire more than God. And this man's true idol, the thing he truly valued, the thing that his true worth was based on was his wealth. One author says this, the man needs ethical completeness. So true obedience to all God has said in his revealed word. And Jesus then turns to the primary problem in his life that his possessions have become his God and have replaced God in his life. So, the only recourse is to do what must be done with any idol, get rid of it. Moreover, if he's to truly love his neighbor, he must sell the idolatrous possessions and then give the money to the poor. This doesn't mean he had never engaged in almsgiving. He could not have said that he kept all the commandments if he hadn't. But Jesus is not talking about almsgiving, but idolatry. That's the real heart of the issue. So Jesus points out the problem in this young man's life. And I think in our culture, this is the problem with so many people in our world, in our culture. It may be even a problem with us here. And that is this idea of possessions and great wealth. Are you wealthy? How many of you, if I said, I'm wealthy, would raise your hand? I'll ask for brave... We'll, Close your eyes. How many of you are wealthy? Raise your hand. This is where we get into a problem, right? Compared to what? 
right? Compared to Jeff Bezos, I'm in poverty, right? Right? But compared to a family that we support that lives in South America, I'm incredibly wealthy, right? So the problem becomes, how do I, how do I compare my wealth? To what do I compare it? And, and this is the real danger, and this is why Jesus, I think, begins to bring this up in terms of how uh, eternal life works is because the young man's wealth has become his idol, his God, what he worships, and I don't mean that he bows down to his bank account. What I mean is that it's how he finds satisfaction, how he knows he matters, why, how, how he counts himself as valuable, right? My family and I were watching some, some little news videos this week, and we learned about a certain type of good that wealthy people buy to display their wealth to other people. You know what an example of that is? A Rolex watch. A Rolex is a way to, to broadcast to other people your wealth. But we do that in all sorts of ways, don't we? Cars, all sorts of vehicles, right? Where I live, how big my house is, how I furnish it. All of this is projection, right, of wealth. And, and I think that, that like the young man, we kind of have this problem. And Jesus is addressing this and saying, we all have this problem. And if you want to know how eternal life really works, you've got to understand that it's replacement, it's not addition. What do I mean by replacement? Jesus says, I've got to be in the spot where your money is. Go sell everything you have. Give it away and then come and follow me. Make me the thing that you follow. Make me the thing that is the source of worth, of value. Make me the thing that makes you know you matter. Can I tell you that that's easy to say and hard to do? Because it means surrendering to God. I'll never forget, I had a friend. I won't mention her name, but we were kind of explaining the gospel to her over the course of maybe six months to a year. And I'll never forget, one day we were in our living room, just talking with her, and she goes, I understand the gospel. She goes, I get it. I need to surrender everything to Jesus, give up the things that I've made the most important, and make him the most important thing. We go, yes, exactly. She says, I can't do that. Like the young man, she went away sad because she realized the cost. That's how eternal life actually works. It's this replacement reaction where you replace the thing in your life that's the thing that you count as valuable and you replace it with Jesus. And this is why Jesus says it's so difficult for the rich to get into heaven because riches, wealth, and possessions create a sense of security apart from God. Hey, guess what? Do I have to go to God today on my knees and beg for dinner tonight for my family? Do I have to get down and say, God, please, have somebody provide something. We need just a few mouthfuls. Do I have to do that? No. So that makes it easy to rely on my own strength and not on God. Do I have to go to God and say, God, please, protect us from this windstorm? We're living outside in a you know, shelter that got blown to bits, and last night the wind started, and it's just destroyed everything, we didn't sleep, do I, have to, do I have to pray that way to God? I go, no, God, I, I've got a job and my wife has a job and we can afford a house that protects us from the wind, right? So the riches that we have, the wealth that we have becomes an obstacle to that replacement reaction because do I really need God very much? That's why it's so hard. So if these riches are this hurdle to heaven, I think the disciples then ask a great question. They say, well, can anyone get in? I want you to also see that the young man is rich in two ways, right, when the disciples ask this question. So let's go back and look at kind of what Jesus says, because the young man goes away sad because he's learned he's got to give up the things that are the most important to him and put Jesus in that spot. And then Jesus turns to the disciples, and he says, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven? How was the young man rich? Two ways. He was rich in wealth, but he was also morally rich. He was rich in good deeds, right? And so because of that, he trusted in himself. It wasn't like he was really wealthy and knew he was an absolute scumbag, right? We know people like that who probably are not going to say, I'm going to heaven. 
right? But he's rich in two ways, so he's doubly blind to the problem going on. And so then Jesus explains to the disciples how hard it is to get into heaven for the rich. And then they're shocked. And they say to Jesus, well, then who can get in? When they hear this, they're greatly astonished. And Jesus uses this kind of, you know, fable that you've all heard about, right? It's easier for a camel to get into the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. You guys heard this before? Okay, I want to tell you right now, there is no gate in some wall in a city that camels crawl through, okay? If you've heard that taught, that's wrong, okay? That, that myth kind of started in the 1500s, okay? There is no evidence of that. There's no camel's gate that camels would go through. It's hogwash, and, and the reason I want you to understand that is because if that was Jesus' point, then it would be that heaven could be entered with great humility. Just get down on your knees, take off all your baggage, go real slow, and you can get into the city, right? That's not Jesus' point. Jesus' point is that it is impossible for a camel to go through a needle. And I really looked into renting a camel and having it here this morning on the stage but they said it would spit, so I decided not to bring it. And I wanted to hold up a needle and say, can the camel go through the eye of the needle? Very, very slowly in microscopic parts, right? If it gets atomized, that's the only way. Jesus' point is that you can't get in. If you're morally rich, if you're physically rich, you're not getting into heaven on those merits, on that basis, and the disciples are flabbergasted. Well, then, who's going? Heaven is going to be an empty place, lots of room. I guess I'm going to have a giant master suite, right? And Jesus says, no, you're misunderstanding. It's not about what you do. It's not about your good behavior. It's not about your wealth. That's not a sign of God's favor, right? Having riches is not a sign of God's favor. It's, in fact, impossible for men to get into heaven on their own power. But Jesus says, but with God it's possible. How does that happen? How is it possible for God? Jesus is saying to us that you cannot enter heaven unless you give up the things that you count like this young man counted as his riches. And I want to extend this beyond just riches for us. Okay, first I wanted to address the issue of wealth. We are all, if you live in this country, incredibly, incredibly wealthy. And you have to see that. You have to know that, believe that. Yeah, you might not be as rich as somebody else in this room, but you're richer than somebody else in this world. And aside from that, even if you have no physical wealth, absolute abject poverty, Jesus would still tell you it's almost impossible for you to get into heaven apart from him. Because we all have riches in other ways. What are the things that, like this young man, we have riches that we value ourselves by? Maybe our physique. How much time do you spend working out in the gym? Well, pre-COVID. Right? Now, how much time are you, what are the, the cycles with the video screens? Peloton. Yeah. How much time pelotoning are you spending, right? Making sure that you're toned, that you have, you know, a six-pack and not a keg. That, <laughs> that you're looking good, right? How much time do you invest in makeup or shaving or clothing or whatever to make sure that you are looking good? Is that your wealth? What about family? Is that your wealth that you think, boy... I've got kids and extended family, and family is so important to us. We spend all this time together. You just pour your effort, your time, your energy into family. Is that your wealth? What are other ways that we count as wealth? You see, I, it, I don't want us to get hung up just on riches, but I wanted to make sure that we talk about riches first because Jesus is definitely talking about material wealth here, and you must see that you are rich, Okay? But aside from that, there are other ways that we have riches. So you got to be able to give all of that up. Tim Keller says this, that what Jesus is saying is that I want you to give up the thing that you think will give you a life of power and joy without God. 
And I think those things are in all of our hearts, whether we know Jesus or not. I think there are things in our heart that we think will give us power and joy apart from God. Jesus says it's through God alone that this is possible. Your own power can never summon enough willpower to give those things up. Your own power can never summon enough willpower to give those things up. But it's through Christ alone that you are supernaturally enabled to begin to give up the things that you hold most precious. And this is what Jesus means in uh, John 6.65 when he says, No one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. That's what Paul means in Romans when he says that the mind of flesh does not submit to the law of God. And in 1 Corinthians, he says, A natural man cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. And in Ephesians, he says, We were dead in our trespasses and its sins. It's impossible for a dead man to be converted unless God does the impossible and raises him to life by dying in his place. Because only God can save people. But we got to be careful. Let's say that you hear this message and you go, okay, I'm going to make sure that my riches, my wealth, my possessions, that those things aren't my idols. The great danger in that is that we succeed, right? And if we're not careful, then we successfully avoid the idols of riches only to find ourselves with a new idol of self-congratulation. I love it. An author wrote that, and I just love that, right? It's so dangerous to slip into a different idol. So how do you get the power to live the way that Jesus is talking about? And why, I think, also would you want to live this way? How can you get the power to live this way? I think that you have to learn that if you sacrifice for Jesus in this life, there is going to be great abundance in the next life. Here's the tricky thing, though. If you say, okay, I want abundance in the next life, then you won't get Jesus. Because what you want is what he gives you rather than him himself. So, But when you live this way, living for Jesus, having him replace all the things that you find as significant in your life, the things that you think might give you power and joy without God, when you live that way, then you start to get the power to to transform from the inside out. And I think the only way to do that, to begin to get that power, is to see that Jesus himself cast aside all his riches. He cast aside all of his power. He cast aside his position. He cast aside his life. Everything that we would think is valuable, is a a source of identity, is something that I would want to hold on to, Jesus throws it away. Philippians 2.6 says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you see this, and to the extent that you see it, that will enable you to begin to cast away the things that you count as valuable, that you count as wealth. Do you see it? Can you see what Jesus did in throwing away everything to have you? When you do that, that's when you can start to get rid of all the stuff that are the idols of your heart. Jesus was willing to surrender everything to to the Father, and because he did that, he gained everything. And until you see that, I don't think you can know the gospel. And you're still going to be hung up on the fact that the gospel is something that you do. And it's never that. It's something that Jesus did for you. And when you know that, that's when you get transformed from the inside out. I want to leave you with a, a poem from John Newton, old-time hymn writer. He wrote this. Since I have known the Savior's name and what for me he bore, 
No more I toil for empty fame. I thirst for gold no more. Placed by his hand in this retreat, I make his love my theme, and I see that all the world calls great is but a waking dream. We're going to go into our time of communion. If you're at home watching right now, now's a great time for you to get some bread or some juice. You can do communion with us. If you're here, we've got communion elements set up on the back back there and back over here, and I would encourage you during the next song to just get up. And what a great transition to think about communion because on the cross, we see Jesus absolutely surrendering everything to the Father. His very blood, and he didn't withhold any of that, right? He didn't just give a portion of his blood. He gave his whole entire life for you. And when you see that, you can take communion and rejoice that you can give everything back to him, knowing that you're his greatest treasure. And when you do that, he says at the end of life, or the next stage of life, you get a hundredfold incredible abundance. That's an amazing thought, and I want to leave you with that. Take communion today and celebrate the fact that if you're with Christ, you have great abundance, great life with him in the next stage of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get a chance to take communion this morning and to, to, to be aware of your sacrifice and help us then to live a life of sacrifice for you. God, it's so hard to give up the things that we value, our riches, our wealth, there, anything in our heart that we want ahead of you, we got to give that up, and it's hard, Lord. I pray that you would supernaturally empower us to do that with your spirit. If there are people here this morning that haven't done that yet, I pray that you would move on them to come to you in prayer, to just yield everything to you. And for those men and women that have already done this, I pray that you would powerfully encourage them this morning to keep living that way for you. In your name I pray, amen.